Okay, um, I'm reading from Proverbs um, chapter 18, and um, a few verses here. There is um, uh, verse six, maybe verse seven. A fool's mouth is his destruction, and his lips are the snare of his soul. A fool's mouth is his destruction, and his lips are the snare of his of his soul. Then is going on to verses um, 20, 21, and 22. Right? A man's stomach shall be satisfied from the fruit of his lips. From the produce of his lips, he shall be satisfied. Death and life are in the power of the tongue. And those who love it will eat its fruit. Then in the same, you know, the same thought, it just goes on to say, he who finds a wife finds a good thing and obtains favor from the Lord. Uh, but I just want us to focus on, you know, verse 7, verse 20, and verse 21, uh, which talks about the power of words. Verse 7 says, the lips are a snare of a soul, which means the words that we release, um, it can actually be a snare. It, it can be a trap for our soul. And it, you know, it, it makes sense because... Um, when we speak words, when we speak words that are, uh, uh, you know, unedifying, when we speak words that are negative, um, you know, words of unbelief, they are a snare for the soul. In the sense, our mind, our thoughts, our imaginations, uh, everything, uh, it becomes trapped, trapped by the words that we speak. You know, when we when we get up in the morning and say, you know, I, I think today is going to be a lousy day. Um, today, uh, I think I'm I'm not going to do well, and 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 things like that. When we speak, it becomes a snare for the soul, you know, where our mind, our thoughts, uh, gets trapped um, with these words. So our thoughts, all thoughts, also go in the same direction. Our emotions also are felt in the same the same way. Okay, verse twenty. Verse twenty. A man's mouth shall be satisfied from the fruit of his mouth. From the produce of his lips, he shall be filled. So the Lord has uh, actually put down a principle um, uh, from related to the words that we speak and how um, from the produce of our lips, we shall be filled. Right? And verse 21, death and life are in the power of the tongue and those who love it will eat its fruit. So uh, in the power of the tongue, uh, there is there's death and there's life in the sense the, the outcome can be so so diverse and so different and uh, it's as you know extreme as death and life and it's in the power of the tongue in the sense you can speak life over something you can release words of faith or we can speak death negative things and uh, and uh, and you know maybe it's some project maybe it's some something um, uh, you can actually speak death over it so it's very clear uh, and those who love it will eat its fruit, meaning, you know, what is the outcome that we want and we will enjoy or experience the fruit of it. Right? So about the power of the tongue, um, you know, we may know these uh, verses, we may have heard these verses, uh, but just a reiteration of that so that we are careful in what we speak and what we profess, what we conf confess. But of course, it comes from what we believe as well, like in the depths of our heart, right? Okay, so let's pray. Right. Father, we thank you. Thank you for this day. Thank you for the way you've designed us. Lord, I thank you for the way, um, the principles that you've laid down in your word or regarding the words that we speak, oh God. And Father God, we thank you for the, um, when we look at these examples and these verses that we just read, and when we look at the negative of it, God, we know that we can turn it around and look at the positive of it, the words we speak. Lord, I pray, may it bring life. May we speak words of life. May we speak words of faith. May we speak words in alignment, God, with your word. And may we say what you say, Lord, about, about everything, about various things, Father God. And Lord, I pray that this um, today, that um, the words that we speak, oh God, will be a uh, uh, will will be a snare for good things, Father God, in our soul, um, Lord. That our soul will be, uh, Lord, positively ensnared, O oh God, with uh, Lord good thoughts and uh, thoughts of faith, O oh God, faith-building thoughts and faith-building emotions, God. 
so that our strength is not drained out by unbelief or anxiety or fear, but our strength is built up in faith, God. We thank you, Lord, and we maybe choose to speak life and enjoy the fruit of it. We thank you. In Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. Amen. Okay. Um, God bless. Uh, let's, uh, let's start from where we um, paused last class. We were looking at chapter 5. Right? We we're looking at chapter five, and we were studying um, attitudes, uh, temperament, and behavior. Uh, a very important aspect to con uh, to look into, uh, because of um, uh, you, you know because of uh, um, interpersonal relationship that we are, you know, that we are studying about. It's uh, it's not just us, um, but it's also involves one other person. Uh, in the light of marriage or in the light of uh, a marriage that we are considering right so so when we look at all that we see that um, uh, our attitude our temperament and our behavior uh, really matters um, why does it matter because uh, that is how we come across and right? that is how we come across the way uh, we interact our attitude our our temperament, our personality, or our behavior uh, is what is put on display. Or, you know, when we express ourselves, when we interact um, with others, this is what uh, comes on display. Or this is what is like, it's like a vehicle which expresses what's in our heart. So um, it's very important uh, that we develop our attitude it's ever it's important that we again build up our uh, temperament shape our temperament and uh, and also our behavior right uh, build our behavior so uh, like we uh, said last class we said okay this is how we think the way we think the way we perceive things right perceive meaning the way we um, understand um, uh, collect information understand the way we act the way we uh, step out and do things, and the way we communicate. Right? Um, this affects us personally, and this also affects us interpersonally, as in the case of marriage. So um, when it comes to attitude or a perceived way of thinking, um, a set way of thinking, a set way of looking at things, um, looking at situations, um, our attitude needs to be Christ-like. That's the first thing. Our attitude needs to be Christ-like, um, and uh, we'll, we'll again look at the verses, scriptures, several verses which talk about that. That our attitude needs to be Christ-like. The secondly, our temperament, our personality, you know what we are like. Um, you know there there are different um, you know personalities, and each one of us is unique, uh, shaped by. Uh, uh, what we, I mean, where we grew up, excuse me, where we grew up, uh, our experiences and all that. So our personality can be very, very different, right? One person can be very, very positive, very, very um, outgoing. The other person can be quiet, very reflective, um, you know, very thoughtful um, and, uh, you know, sometimes pessimistic, all that, right? So um, temperament needs to be spirit-led or spirit control, led by the Holy Spirit, right? controlled by the Holy Spirit, and even shaped by the Holy Spirit. Now, that's very, very important. Okay. And the third thing is that our behavior um, cannot be based on, um, you know, cannot be irration irrational, um, cannot be, you know, up and down all the time, but our behavior needs our actions our lifestyle everything needs to be governed by the word governed by the word meaning ruled and reigned okay god's government is um his word so we need to be governed our behavior needs to be governed by the word of god so the word of god needs to be central in our lives as individuals okay only then will it um, overflow into any other covenant relationship right so, um, so when it comes to attitude, okay. So we see, uh, you know, several scriptures uh, which talk about attitude, the way, uh, a set way of thinking, a set way of perceiving things. Um, so, 
you know, if you're following the notes, chapter five, looking at attitude, Christ-like attitude, we see in Philippians two, verses three to eight, and um, verse five talks about the attitude that we should have should be the one that Christ had. Okay, so so it's very clear that uh, Christ is our example, and the attitude uh, that He had is uh, is something that we need to put on or we need to emulate in our lives. Now, this is important. This is applicable in marriage, or I would say more so in marriage. You know, the New King James says, let this mind be in you, which was in Christ Jesus. Let this mind be in you, which was in Christ Jesus. So uh, our way of looking at things needs to be the way Jesus would, okay? the way our, our, our thoughts, our, our thought patterns, uh, our analysis of things would be how the Lord would, the way we inter interact with people, uh, the way we consider people who are maybe uh, maybe more talented than us, um, more skilled than us, the way we consider people who are, you know, who are rude to us, who are, um, uh, you know, who are unkind, who speak rude words, who speak unkind words, you know, the way we perceive them, the way we interact with them should start with this mind. Right? That our mind, our attitude should be that of Christ. So it's very, uh, very important. Um, so that will actually, you know, if you look at it, that will solve a lot of problems. You know, um, many times when it comes to marriage, um, we we kind of let down our guard over a period of time. And we say, okay, this is now where I don't put on any masks. So I will be, um, you know, I will be myself. I will be, uh, you know, uh, so I'm, I'm just going to be who I am. So we do, we let, you know, whatever comes to our mind. Uh, and, and sometimes, you know, our attitude is the worst when it, when it comes to people who are close to us. You know, that's the that's a pathetic part of it, right? People who are close to us, maybe in the home, you know, maybe people who who. Uh, you know, because we there is no there's no guard, there's no masks, there are no masks, right? So we let down our guard, and um, and we our attitude is the worst at home with the loved ones. But the fact is that this verse, "Let this mind be in, be in you," that was in Christ Jesus, applies to the closest or uh, and the value most valued of relationships, covenant relationships as well. So in marriage with a spouse, you know, this verse applies. So this will actually set us or position us um, for, for our relationship to be successful, to thrive. Okay, so um, so this is this is what it says. Okay, so um, let's look at one more scripture. Uh, that is 1 Thessalonians 5, 16, you know, uh, where Paul says, rejoice always, right? pray at all times. Uh, be thankful in all circumstances, and this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. And right? rejoice always. Um, so, so is it? You know, is is it? Uh, maybe we've read this verse and we've sung it. Sung this, you know, um, while ministering to people, um, we've sung it. We've said, you know, this is a great way to start uh, maybe a worship set, and we say, you know, uh, I'm just trying to see the New King James. Rejoice always. Pray without ceasing. Yeah. So it's it's a great way when you know we, we use it to minister to people, but then personally for us, you know, is that our attitude? Okay, uh, I know it's it's a it's it's a challenging one. You know, we might say we, we can come out with n number of reasons why uh, you know our attitude is this and not how it should be. We can we can say it's because of this, because of this, but then uh, mindful of the fact that um, Paul wrote it uh, not in the best of circumstances. Right, especially when you look at Philippians two, when he says, uh, when he writes Philippians two and verse fourteen, uh, do everything without complaining or arguing, or um, uh, uh, yeah, so that you may be uh, innocent and pure. You know, that's the question, right? Um, let me just look at uh, read out from the New King James as well. Uh, do all things without complaining and disputing, that you may become blameless and harmless children of God without fault in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation among whom you shine as lights in the world. Okay, so uh, in whatever environment, whether it's, it's a home, 
uh, whether it's you know the workspace everything you know it, it this applies so complaining arguing i think our complaining level is the highest if you have a complainometer within the four walls of the home right uh, complaining level or arguing level everything uh, is is at its highest right if you have to measure it um so um so this applies here so this should be our attitude that we we be christ like um and we have qualities like um, you know selflessness humility uh, sacrifice um being joyful being thankful being prayerful you know all that these scriptures talk about um like philippians 4 uh, verses 4 to 8 um let me just read that um philippians 4 4 to 8 okay rejoice in the lord always again i will say rejoice um let your gentleness be known to all men the lord is at hand okay um verse 5 chapter 4 verse 5 let your gentleness be known so is my gentleness known in this relationship right known in marriage towards my spouse or is a spouse only aware of you know the, the kind of rudeness the bluntness or maybe sometimes even silence right so this attitude is a big thing okay so maybe as individuals you know as uh, as single people um maybe we didn't really check on this you know, just as like believers right we're all growing we're all maturing and um, and the need is more when it comes to marriage um if if there's some fast track to do this i think you know single people who are looking out or you know considering marriage should really apply this because it will it will it will really solve a lot of things it will position uh, personally the person who's considering marriage for for a you know for for a good relationship for a good start right so um the opposite of these qualities christ like qualities are or what we can call as unchrist like qualities or attitudes we need to check right it could be uh, let me just read through the list which is in our notes um i think it can be an eye opener right uh, it is there in scripture all these scriptures um but if you read that list you know uh, i think it can be an eye opener okay let me just go through that anger arrogance being argumentative blaming others bitterness controlling condescending meaning looking down on others all the time cowardice being fearful not taking decisions not stepping up to our responsibilities you know that's how it applies cowardice in marriage complaining critical all the time um cunning being manipulative cynical right um demanding depressive dishonest dissatisfaction discontentment deceptive envy greed guarded guilt hatred inadequacy indifference intolerance insecurity irresponsibility jealousy judgmental low self esteem lust manipulative negativity overly assertive overly aggressive pessimism prejudice pride resentment revengeful rude sarcasm secretive self centeredness selfishness shame skeptical stingy suspicious thoughtlessness unforgiving untrusting unsympathetic victimized you know it's a it's a bad list right a bad list of bad attitude um but it's a descriptive list and i think it it'll do well uh we'll do well to avoid it we'll do well to come out of it you know there could be shades of this in our lives right uh, especially in our close relationships there should be there could be shades of this in our lives and uh we need to come out of it we need to uh, you know develop ourselves come out of it so yeah um so when we have these kind of attitudes uh, uh in us or ingrained in us it actually the way we perceive things changes right the way we see things the way we see others you know let's say if we are always negative always cynical maybe because of you know it could be because of various reasons uh, or suspicious right uh, because maybe whomever we met interacted with 
um, you know, could not be trusted or over a period of time, uh, they did something, they were unfaithful, you know, untrustworthy. So when we have a very suspicious attitude, we begin to see others through that lens all the time. Okay. Oh, that person is, uh, you know, my spouse is talking to someone. I wonder what he is talking. I wonder what she is saying. Maybe it's about me. Um, why is that person talking to, you know, another guy or another girl? You know, what is it? You know, maybe it's something, you know, maybe they're being unfaithful. You know, things like that. Extremely suspicious. Um, and maybe insecure. Right. So these these attitudes uh, have to change. Because, you know, if we have that suspicious nature, let's say, for example, we have that suspicious attitude and uh, we carry it into marriage and our spouse is very outgoing, friendly, right? Outgoing, friendly, very social. It'll just create hell because every interaction we begin to suspect. Right? Every interaction we begin to be suspicious. Um, initially, it's just within us. And uh, the way we talk to our spouse changes. Maybe at initially, it could be, you know, it could be masked. It could be just within. Uh, you're trying to suppress all those uh, emotions, suspicions, and everything. But eventually, it'll explode. It'll come out. And at the slightest of conflict, at the slightest of arguments, it just comes out, and uh, and it affects the relationship in a big way. Right? So, so that's the thing. So when we, what we see, how we perceive others, how we communicate with others, um, and uh, how we behave, you know, it it affects. So our our negative attitudes keep us, prevent us from being Christ-like. Okay. So, so attitude is a big thing. The second one is temperament, in in the sense, um, you know, the way the way you are, temperamentally, personality-wise. So that also is uh, affects the way we think, we perceive things, we behave, everything. So temperamentally, um, of course, you know, uh, human behavior, scientists of human behavior, or people who study human behavior, say, okay, um, temperamentally, uh, they slot people, okay, into introverts and extroverts, and uh, um, maybe you know the typical classical. Uh, Character, characteristic um, temperaments are like sanguine, choleric, melancholy, you know, like very moody, phlegmatic, and so on. So, it, it these are this is a theory. This is these are based on observations. Uh, it's not proven. Um, proven in the sense uh, there could be exceptions, um, and people can be you know sometimes introverted, sometimes extroverted. And people can be sometimes moody, you know, sometimes very uh, uh, outgoing, etc. So there could be shades of all this, right? But by and large, we know that you know just studying this would help us. Um, but the fact is that regardless of whatever shade or you know overlapping personality types that we could be, um, or maybe we are born with, and you know. Uh, the personality type because of our environment, good, bad, or the behavior that we learned because of you know whom we grew up with, maybe the example set by parents and so on. Okay, we can always unlearn the ba bad. Okay, so once we have an understanding, okay, this is part of my temperament, and it's not really helping me, and it definitely won't help in the relationship. So I have to unlearn. Okay, uh, I may be very uncommunicative, secretive, very closed you know, as a person, and maybe that's how I grew up. You know, uh, maybe one grows up saying, "Okay, whatever was spoken was made fun of, belittled, uh, cancelled out." So what happens over a period of time? The person says, "I, you know, I'd rather not say anything. Right? I'll be closed." I don't want to be made fun of. I don't want to, uh, you know, my ideas to be shot down. So I'm not going to say anything. So, so that's that's the baggage, you know. That's how it. So that behavior or that temperament can be unlearned. Right? Where you realize that okay, this is not helping. It's going to affect my, you know, marriage. 
um, because if I'm going to be like this, then I cannot really, uh, if I'm going to be, you know, I'm, I'm going to be fearful of being hurt because of the words that I speak, fearful of being rejected because of the ideas that I communicate or the, the love that I express. Uh, if I'm going to be fearful of that and because of it, I don't, then, you know, it doesn't really help the relationship. Uh, I'm going to be afraid all the time. I'm going to be um, uh, negative all the time, right? And the person who's my spouse is is not is not able to receive anything, right? No expression of love. Uh, uh, well, you know, then ultimately there'll be some comparison and and all that, right? So further we go into a shell. So I, we can unlearn these things, and we can develop. Now it's going to take effort. It's going to take time. It's going to be. Uh, it's going to take some effort, but it can be done. Right? We can learn. Uh, and the the beautiful thing is this: that we have as our teacher, and we have as the one who empowers us, the Holy Spirit, and He indwells us. You know? So that's why you know there's so much hope in a Christian marriage and family. There's always hope. Hope for change. Hope for things to, you know, um, things to turn around. There's always hope. When, um, you know, when a, when a husband and wife look to the Lord and uh, they're led by the Lord, there's always hope. So you see, you know, this whole thing of being unequally yoked, you know, again, you know, is, is, is not something that will actually help a marriage. Right? So if the husband and the wife are looking to the Lord, and not just ritualistically, you know, Christians, but really uh, disciples of the Lord Jesus, wanting to, desiring to please the Lord, His word, obey His word, and being led by the Spirit each and every day, not just when it comes to major decisions, but also each and every day, right? So, um, so this is what uh, we see in Galatians um, chapter five. Um, let's just read that what the Holy Spirit does and um, what he brings into a believer's life. Okay, Galatians 5.22 talks about um, the fruit of the Spirit, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Okay, this is the fruit of the Spirit, meaning the end result of the Holy Spirit working in our spirit, in our heart. And we cooperating with the promptings and the leading of the Holy Spirit. So the Holy Spirit empowers us with His love. The Holy Spirit empowers us with His presence. And He brings these characteristics in, into our lives, into our temperament. Right? So, so that's a beautiful thing. So where there was, you know, uh, confusion, the Holy Spirit develops, and the, the fruit of peace is developed, is released. Where there was total negativity and moodiness and and um, you know depression and anxiety, the Holy Holy Spirit releases joy. Okay, and uh, joy is something that's. You know, sometimes it's so unreasonable, you know, when even like peace, you know, it's like peace which goes beyond our understanding. You know, we don't, we're not able to give reason for it. We're not able to give proof for it. Joy also it says joy inexpressible is what the Holy Spirit bring, brings. You know, joy inexpressible means that you know I don't know. It's it's just outrageous. You know, I just do stuff and because of this joy and. And where there was, you know, all these negative things, negative um, uh, qualities, the Holy Spirit brings about. So our spirit control temperament, you know, where there there seems to be a situation where we can go uh, lash out, um, uh, react negatively. We are responding instead of reacting. We are responding with patience. Right? We are responding with self control. And uh, so, so we see that, yeah, you know, the, the temperament is led by the spirit and, and how we think, how we see things, how we perceive, how we communicate is being changed. Okay. See, this is the normal Christian life, right? 
this is why the holy spirit came, comes in and dwells us and this normal christian life is so so required and important for a normal christian marriage right um so that's that's the thing so um other scriptures uh, which uh, talk about you know freedom in the spirit, this joy and peace uh, by the Holy Spirit. So he brings in that. He brings in his rule and reign, righteousness, peace and joy. Um, the reign of the king he brings into our lives. Okay. So that's about the temperament. So we looked at our attitude, we looked at temperament and then and the third one is uh, you know word governed behavior. okay so that's again a very, very important. Um, word governed behavior so our uh, behavior uh, let me just uh, share a screen with you okay All right so word governed behavior so that means that the word of god the standards of god's word um, everything that we uh, see, um, I hope that's come onto the screen. Yeah. So everything that we see there is governed by the word of God. Okay. So there is God's government, God's ruling and God's shaping. Um, and it's by the word of God. Uh, if you look at, um, uh, let me just go to that scripture again. Um, you know, the Lord Jesus he says, uh, when it comes to even our expression of love for him he says if you love me obey my commandments right so the word of god uh, needs to be obeyed and the believer uh, for the believer the privilege is to enjoy that outcome of obeying god right uh, have the outcome of obeying god in his or her life okay? so if you love me you will obey my commands that's what the lord jesus said and we see that um, the word of god scripture holy scriptures are inspired by him and uh, you know so many uh, so many facets of it right useful for teaching the truth uh, for reproach for correction and instruction for and to be equipped the the person you know the man of god woman of god for righteous living okay and uh, and this is what uh, so the word of God does. So, so we, we need to be governed by uh, the word of God. Okay. So when we look at the next verse, um, which is Colossians 3, 12. So here is the requirement. Okay. Let's look at that. Um, Colossians 3. And uh, okay. Colossians 3, 12. Right? Um, Therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, put on tender mercies, kindness, humility, meekness, long-suffering, bearing with one another and forgiving one another. If anyone has a complaint against another, even as Christ forgave you, so also you must do. Okay. So um, let me just read that in the... Good News Bible version, what we see on the screen, you know, you are the people of God, he loved you and chose you for his own. So then you must clothe yourself. Okay? So it must be part of part of you uh, with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, patience. Be tolerant, forgive one another. If you have a complaint against someone else, you must forgive just as the Lord has forgiven. So this is a classic, um, if you want to say, you know, a thumb rule for marriage. If both are actively pursuing this, like both the husband and the wife are actively pursuing it, have an understanding of it, and and have this as their value. Okay, um, saying that you know I'm going to clothe myself with this, with these characteristics. How I'm going to be led by the Spirit. I'm going to have these. Um, I'm going to pursue God, pursue, follow the Holy Spirit, and. Uh, his promptings, his instructions, and I know that he is working in me to bring out these this fruit in me. Um, so I'm going to do that, and I'm going to be tolerant, and I'm going to forgive, you know, as God in Christ forgave. Right? That's the standard of my uh, forgiveness. You know, 
so which is uh, which is an amazing thing um, if we would just have this kind of behavior this kind of interaction in our lives okay um in first peter uh, chapter 3 i think we looked at that verse chapter 3 and verse 7 so he talks about how um, the husband should treat the wife and vice versa and um, he says husbands likewise okay so before that he says wives likewise in chapter 3 and verse 1 husbands likewise um sorry um be submissive to your own husbands and uh, and so on and then with verse 7 husbands likewise dwell with them with understanding. So there's a lot of instructions given there, you know, understand, respect, etc. And uh, and the thing is this, so that you, as being heirs together of the grace of life, that your prayers may not be hindered. So, so nothing actually blocks out, nothing acts as a ceiling for your prayers, as a barrier for your prayers. Right? So this is, um, nothing is stopping this which means that if i'm not doing this then i'm definitely you know letting something else interfere with my prayers because my motive is not correct and you know um so i'm not in the right place with god i'm holding a grudge with, with another person and um, i'm not really being christ-like right? and so uh, so my prayer is being hindered you know i'm not able to pray in faith so the rest of the verses you know till verse 11 talk about uh, what we should do and what we should not do. Okay, so uh, a lot of uh, important, uh, you know, verses. So when we look at this, normally we think, okay, it's it's for the other person, or, or you know, uh, the other person should do this with me, or even for me, you know, it's for someone else out there. But it's it's right in there, someone else in the home, or to be recipient of this, right? Even if they are being faced with some cursing and and etc okay so um don't pay back evil don't uh, which means don't be vengeful uh, and keep back from speaking evil and stop telling to stop telling lies uh, do good strive for peace with all your heart okay so this uh, leads us to the next um, a, a topic which is transformation okay so we are actually talking about that Right? dealing with transformation meaning okay so all this you know how can my life be transformed you know it seems like a big ask it seems like a big demand right on my emotions on my time it seems like a big demand okay so how do i personally you know uh, come to a place of change right um, is it possible possible to, for me to do something so that I can be changed. I can be transformed. Okay, so the, the, which means we are talking about radical change. Okay, um, is there anything that I should do? Okay, so there are four things that we go, we can look at. One is uh, for us to, you know, um, for us to think about, for us to actually come to an understanding with and accept. Okay, firstly is, I'm sorry. First thing is about what Christ did for us on the cross. Okay, the finished work of the Lord on the cross. You know, when we uh, when we consider uh, the finished work on the cross, um, uh, you know, we we go to verses like Isaiah fifty three, and by the stripes of Jesus, I am healed. You know, there's a great transaction. There's a great exchange that happened. Um, his blood, um, the blood was shed. That, that perfect sacrifice. So, because of which, I'm a new creation. Like, there's a change in identity. Um, there's a change in destiny, all that happened, and I'm born again, I've received a brand new spirit, and, and all that, all that is true. And, and, and then the fact that, you know, I, I'm healed. I'm, so this healing has to, is actually for the body, the mind, the spirit, all realms, okay? And uh, the fact is that the old man, or the sinful nature, what was generating sin, Okay. What was actually fueling our expressions, what was fueling our behavior to live in a sinful manner, what was fueling our attitude, okay, right from within, that was put to death. Okay, so we need to understand that. Uh, because if we still believe that hey, I'm 
I know I'm born again. I know I'm a child of God. But what to do? You know, I'm only human. Right? If we have that attitude, if we have that understanding, then um, you know we can do a lot of things. But then it's going to be because of our willpower. And uh, if we don't accept this truth or embrace this truth, then we are missing out on a major aspect of transformation. So this is foundational. What has already been done? Okay. So what has already been done on the cross? It's a completed work of Christ on the cross. So he took our, uh, our sin nature, or as called as uh, Romans 6, we read about it, you know, which is called the old man the, or the body of sin. He put to death. Okay. So what are we talking about You know, when it comes to these temperaments and uh, negative attitudes? Well, that's in the realm of our soul, our mind, in the realm of our thinking. It could be a stronghold in the mind. It could be ingrained thought patterns and behavior patterns which are still ingrained in the realm of our mind. Right? Uh, um, so that uh, uh, that is something that you know we need to deal with. Okay? But what was fueling that realm of the soul? Right? What was fueling that that internal engine which was actually giving power to those bad attitudes, giving power to those strongholds? Now that Christ removed. That has been put to death. So what is fueling it right now? It's just our permission. Right? It's it's just our exposure, you know, our exposing ourselves to the things of the flesh, our un unwillingness to renew our mind and thinking to the ways and the word of God. So now that internal engine has been has been destroyed. Okay. So let's look at uh, Romans six. Okay, Romans 6 and uh, verse 6, uh, we'll close, uh, we'll take a break after. Oh, we have time, okay. So Romans 6 and verse 6. Knowing this, that our old man was crucified with him, that the body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves to sin. Okay, if that is not powerful, I don't know what this, right? That our old man, this body of sin, was crucified with him. So it's something that was already done. Um, that the body of sin might be done away with. That we should no longer be slaves of sin. So this is the intent. We go down to verse 14. Uh, For sin shall not have dominion over you. Meaning, sin shall not have dominion you know, we, we look at it in terms of, uh, like, you know, uh, overall sin, but then we, we we consider acts of sin, right? We hardly ever think about attitudes and motives. Uh, we look at outworking, you know, lying, maybe cheating, maybe acts of violence, uh, being unfaithful, you know, maybe things like pornography, all those things, we, we, we consider that to come in this category. But what has been put to death, sin shall, sin shall not have dominion over you, is also in the realm of our attitudes, in the realm of, you know, overwhelming negative emotions, uh, temperamentally, you know, maybe you're thinking of being short-tempered, uh, acts of rage, violent behavior, all that cannot have, you know, sin cannot have dominion over us. Well, this is a powerful truth, okay? And uh, it's one of the things that really helps us uh, to live a transformed life. So embracing this truth, okay. Now, uh, so the, the thing is this: to come to the place and, uh, of truth and say, Lord Jesus, you know, like you took my symptoms, physical symptoms, on the cross. Lord, you took these things, God. These things that fuel, you know, this anger and and this fear and this insecurity and the suspicion and all that, God. I I thank you that you took it on the cross. I thank you that you know your word declares that sin shall not have dominion, meaning upper arm, or uh, you know boss over, or rule over me, will not have dominion. Which means what? Righteousness has dominion over me, right? Um, the rule of God has dominion over me. It's not the rule of sin. It's not the rule of Satan, right? So this is a powerful truth for a husband and a wife to consider uh, and uh, receive. Or husband to be, or wife to be, you know, to say that personally, you know, this is it. Sin shall not have dominion over me because it's been dealt with on the cross. Okay. Second one um, is 
my identity, you know, that the fact that I am a new creation. So this is also something that has already been done. Because of what has been done on the cross, sin shall not have dominion. Because of what has been done on the cross, I am a new creation. I have received new creation life um, because of what has been done on the cross. Okay, so, so that's the second thing, right? My identity. I'm a new creation. Second Corinthians 5 verse 17. I'm a new creation. Um, the old is gone. The new has come. Okay. Uh, the old man is put to death. The old man has been given a you know complete, absolute funeral, fitting funeral. So there's no question of you know resurrecting the old man, right? It's it's dead. Okay. So that actually releases us, liberates us to live. The new life, okay. So, not to slip back into the old life, but to live the new life, okay. So our image changes. So we are no longer saying that, oh poor me, or self pity, or you know low self esteem. We are looking at ourselves in the light of how Christ sees us. Why? Because we are one spirit with Him. Right. The reason is we are washed by the blood of Jesus. Um, we are covered by the blood of Jesus. And uh, and the fact is, spiritually, you know, this is how we are, that we are justified, right? We uh, And we live a life of san sanctification. We are justified by Him. Um, um, and, uh, you know, 2 Corinthians 5, and I think it's verse 23, which says, 21, I think, um, let's read that verse, says that um, He who knew no sin has been made sin for us that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Verse 21, right? So this is the the outcome that we might become the righteousness of God in Christ. So that should actually do wonders for our self-image. When we look at ourselves in the mirror, when we look at, uh, you know, consider ourselves, not as someone who's a nobody, not as someone who is, you know, wretched, no. Not as someone who is worthless, but as someone for whom Christ died, for someone who, whom uh, through you know through Christ has become a new creation. We are one spirit with Him. The, so we have been made a new creation, so that He comes and indwells us. So um, so we are not worthless. Right? So we are. Uh, he He counted us worthy in order to die for us. He counted us you know, of value, so that He. You know, uh, by the, this very act, he elevated us to that place of being seated with him in the heavenly places, right? So, so our identity changes. So, when our identity changes, the way we interact with others changes, right? So, we are not offended easily when when somebody you know is boastful or somebody tries to you know uh, try to do something. We we are not offended because we know our place. We know who we who we are. If somebody tries to, you know, uh, say something uh, or insult us or you know demean us, um, well, if we are strong in our identity, that that really bounces off, right? We are not just pierced through in any way. We just you know, I know you know we begin to actually pity the other person. I, I, oh, it's sad that this person does not, you know, uh, it's, there's so much resentment in them and. We, we begin to, you know, empathize. Or maybe they've got some you know, deep hurts because of which they are behaving that way, right? Because we we turn the focus off ourselves because of our identity in Christ. We're so strong in that, rooted in that. Okay, okay. So that's the second. We'll we look at um, two more things, and when we come back uh, after the break, right? Thank you. <laughs> 